Good morning, good day and good evening from wherever you're watching. I welcome you to this webinar on AI in industrial automation. First of all, let me introduce you our webinar software. If you want to place questions, please first of all click on the Ask button and then place a question here in the Ask a Question window. If you prefer to use email, we also introduce here the meet at backoff.com email address. Because the field of industrial AI is very broad and complex, I invited two people to do this webinar with me together. Welcome Rahul and Tobias from company Tvarit. Rahul, can you please introduce to us the difference between the well-known user AI and industrial AI? Yes, ne definitely. So uh, consumer AI slash user AI, which is pretty famous nowadays, um, there are a lot of innovation happening around the world. One of the biggest example, I think all of you are pretty aware, is um, our mobile phone e-commerce websites. And you would definitely realize when your wives are happy one day, all of a sudden, definitely what is the reason behind it? You would realize they have gone through probably an e-commerce website. There is an AI behind this, and AI is recommending them the best perfume, their favorite perfume. Probably that is the reason of the happiness behind, right? So um, yes, I would like to say here, industrial AI is also becoming more and more democratized. Exactly the example I gave for consumer AI. Definitely today, along with Fabian, we would be speaking more about industrial AI in this webinar. That's, that's true. So thank you for this explanation. And I may want to add that, of course, in industrial AI, we have other requirements compared to user AI. For example, if this forecast for a, if you want to buy, or if you're proposed to, to buy a certain product, if this is only 78 or 80% true, that's okay for user AI. But is this really uh, okay for your industrial process? I don't think so. And also the, the forecasting um, time, if you are watching uh, on the screen of your mobile phone, you have seconds to compute something. If you are in a, an automation process, we talk about microseconds or milliseconds per perspectives. So Rahul, um, you come from company Twarit. Are you so kind to introduce Twarit for us a little bit? Definitely. So. Our company, Twarit GmbH, by the way, I am one of the managing director at Twarit GmbH, um, and we are based out of Frankfurt. That's our headquarters. We also have branch office in Mumbai. Um, one of the unique thing about Twarit GmbH is we have been focusing specifically on manufacturing processes, the artificial intelligence use cases in industry. That's our one of the unique strength. We have been awarded by European Union Horizon 2020. This is one of the biggest program here in Europe. This is a R&D program. And here for this kind of R&D program, uh, um, th they also have via this branch, which is called EDI, European Data Incubator. In this European Data Incubator, there have been more than 490 AI startups from all over Europe. And we stood in top eight startups. So we were chosen top eight startups. And the selection process is also very intensive. They, you have to go through almost one year of project with a very specific industrial customer. You have to implement your technology. You have to show the benefits. And if you are successful, you are award, awarded with this program. Uh, apart from that, as you can see, we, we are also coming from um, AI background, we have 26 plus AI experts. For our customers, as I spoke, this is our business model. We believe in saving money for our customers, not only monetary savings, but also impact in terms of carbon footprint reduction, energy reduction, etc. etc. Then we have launched various products in the market. They are specifically for die casting industry, welding, sheet metal cutting, etc. We will talk more about it. We have so far impacted 54 plus plants. We come from um, Indian background and also German. IIT Mumbai is Indian University and TU Darmstadt, one of the biggest university here in Germany, famous for metal industry. And you would definitely realize if you come to our team parties, you would realize we have Indian Bollywood music plus German beer. So, so this is our culture. Um, and yeah, we do believe that we want to make industrial AI much more simpler to understand for our users. Thank you for this kind introduction. 
So now let's have uh, a small focus on how we interact to each other. Can you uh, start maybe with, with your part and I can hand over? Definitely. So, so um, I mean, as you can see here in one of the example, here this is one of the result from industrial AI application. What does this re this result tell you? What do you what do you see in this image? You will see a wheel, an automotive component which is being manufactured. The process is die casting, but the process can be anything else as well. Maybe sheet sheet metal cutting, etc. Now, on the right, o o o next to wheel, what do you see? a signal, green or red, that shows if this particular automotive component, in this case the wheel, if it is going to be a good wheel or a defective piece. The results are as simple as that, believe me. The AI, industrial AI results, they tell you the prediction of this automotive component, the quality of this component beforehand. This is, this is not it, there goes a lot in the background. And uh, Fabian here definitely would be explaining you what goes exactly in the back, back, back end in order to achieve this result. Yeah, true. So basically all of us already know AI is based on data. And of course, you need to have access to your, from your uh, yeah, PLCs basically, because a PLC knows everything from your machine. It's a central heart. Every signal that is uh, collected from, from sensors in your machine, passes through the PLC, is recalculated and you uh, generate new, uh, yeah, set new data for, for the actuators. So inside the PLC all of your data is available and we are um, providing you as the machine builders or the manufacturers the tools for collecting this data. On top, we also provide in the end the deployment infrastructure for such kind of algorithm that Rahul may, may develop for you. So he's, he's generating the, the model. We can or we hold the infrastructure products to deploy it somehow in the factory floor. As you as a back of customer may already know, back of always acts as the supplier for the automation infrastructure. So um, we provide the components and the software framework. And of course, we are happy to help you to implement your AI algorithms inside the factory floor. So uh, we are completely open. So if you like to model your AI algorithms on your own, we are happy and we support you in that. If, for, uh, for example, you want to have an, yeah, basically an AI service or pr direct products from Tverit, then of course, you're also very welcome to work with Backoff and Tverit together and we help you in the integration. Let me also share with you a study from the Mechanical Engineering Industry Association, VDMA, um, which found that more than 90% of all companies rely on external support and services for the, their AI initiatives. So please don't hesitate to contact us, either Backoff or Tverit, and we can uh, together move on with your AI project. So now let's proceed to a small pie chart here depicting the challenges when implementing AI in industry. So Rahul, from your experience, uh, do you think this, this pie chart is, is correct? What do you experience so far when you spoke to so many different customers? Absolutely, absolutely Fabian. So this pie chart is pretty much correct. I can definitely attest that after almost uh, 54 plus plants we have impacted so far and I can definitely say one of the biggest challenge is rightly pointed out here in this pie chart, unclear use case. Just two days back, a real scenario, I and my colleague Tobias, we were having this call with the customer. Use case, sometimes they talk about quality. Sometimes they talk about improving th their machine uptime. It's always so difficult to estimate how much is ROI, how much is the impact from which use case. And that's where at least one good news is we have this Twarith Industrial AI platform. And via this platform, we already give a very specific ROI estimations for a given use case for a given specific manufacturing process, if we have done that in past. If we have not done that in past, of course, we will enter into this workshop. So definitely, yes, this was one of the biggest challenge. Another challenge, as you can see here, the, the, the fourth, pil third, second pillar is data. Now, data unavailability makes the whole AI initiative fail. 
my friend Fabian definitely can explain more about this data. Sure. So, um, first of all, you need data. Without data, your AI project will not happen. So, and the the Industry 4.0 initiative is one of the the major foundations of the AI initiative. So, you may need to make your data available of your machines, either using uh, yeah, communication protocols like OPC UA, MQTT, or directly implement interfaces to databases like an um, MS SQL or, or Pro Progress SQL database. So that's one of the foundations. Otherwise, um, my friend Raul has no data to work on. Without data, no AI. Sorry. Okay. So the goal of this webinar is to tackle all of those um, yeah, challenges mentioned on this slide. And we hope that we can clarify most things during this webinar. If not, of course, we are open for further discussion. So let's proceed to the buzzword industrial AI. What is industrial AI? So in this case, we tried to sectorize a little bit and collected different kinds of, of descriptive words. So, for example, it is not very new. So if you see in, the, in this blue area, it's a, uh, derived from applied statistics and also optimization theory. So quite old areas in mass and both together form the foundation of artificial intelligence. So not, not really new, but just uh, is the foundation of what we do now here. And basically it's learning on samples or learning from experience. So as we told before, it always relies on data. And if you collect more and more data, we have the foundation to do statistics and also the foundation to optimize algorithms based on that sample data. So that's basically the foundation of AI. Rahul, do you may want to take over and take us through the slide further? Definitely. So, so uh, it, the evolution here, uh, as as Fabian already mentioned, it started from statistics. Then it's it it's, it it we had evolution in terms of algorithmic that learns from the experience. Um, but what next? In this red sphere, you see neural network, you see support vector machine, you see random forest. What are they? They are essentially the algorithms. They have existed for a long time. What is the difference now? What has happened new? In last one decade, something which has happened completely drastically uh, uh, um, new is compute power, number one. Number two, the learning capability. So compute power in terms of CPUs and GPUs. Hardware has become more and more accessible, economy-wise as well as technology-wise. Number two, from capability point of view, these algorithms have become more intelligent. The research community has come up with new uh, learning schemes such as transfer learning. Transfer learning means that you build one AI model for your first machine, for your pilot machine, pilot machine. Now, how do you move from this pilot machine to 10 more similar machines or even different plants within your company? Transfer learning nowadays is not a dream. It exists for image processing and natural language processing. But here in industrial AI community, we are also doing research on transfer learning for sensoric data, which means that in, in, even in industrial AI, this transfer learning would exist and this would go on. Uh, th this would ultimately take us to the final fourth sphere, as you can see here in the brown, abstraction of real and complexity. So the algorithms would become more and more uh, uh, accessible and more and more usable by the users. Thank you for, for this introduction of, of industrial AI. And I think uh, a very interesting approach that you also introduced to me, I wasn't aware of, is the, um, the yeah, description of AI projects together with Six Sigma. Six Sigma is very well Definitely. known in industry and well, it's, it's kind of interesting that we have a very uh, strong relationship uh, to from Lean, Lean Signal to AI. Can you introduce this to our watchers? Perfect. So here in this slide, what we are explaining is how exactly 
artificial intelligence is similar to Six Sigma. Yeah? Um, Six Sigma, Lean Sigma, these approaches are pretty familiar with all of you. Yeah? All the industrial experts, manufacturing experts, foundry managers, or even the production managers, everyone knows Lean Sigma and how to improve the quality, how to improve the machine operations. In this approach, we have define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. These are the five steps. What do we, these steps, why do they exist? They exist in order to achieve these goals. They help us doing operational efficiency improvement, reducing the defect to zero, reducing your energy consumption, CO2 emission, and optimizing your supply chain. This is very clear so far. This was easy. I would like to assure you here is that industrial AI is also following the similar concept. It's just that doing manually, industrial AI is enabling us to do it in an automated manner. Let us understand. So here in the digitalization, if you see the steps of digitalization, industrial AI implementation, step number one is to do assessment of industrial AI readiness. Are you ready? Do you have data? Step number two is sensor and data collection. You collect the data. Step number three is you do the modeling. Four, you do the root cause analysis. Why is particular defect occurring? And finally, you control the process. You give the recommended action items in order to improve the process. No wonder you can by now you would already understand. This has almost one to one mapping. Define, define your problem statement. Measure by collecting the data from sensors. Analyze essentially your AI modeling. And then finally, improve and control is root cause analysis and prescriptive analytics. This is wonderful. Yes, I would definitely uh, like to also show more about this. But let us now understand what kind of concrete applications we have in industrial AI. Perfect. OK, so when it comes to industrial AI applications, here are the four examples. And these four examples are uh, just uh, examples. Eventually, the number of AI use cases in a plant or in industrial setup can be hundreds, thousands. Here we are talking about, for example, uh, context awareness robotics, quality inspection. Fabian, he will present these two use cases. And then we have two another use cases from factory manufacturing shop floor, predictive quality and predictive energy. These two I will explain shortly. So let's then proceed to um, one very specific aspect of, of AI, you can, if you want to depart somehow um, AI modeling, you can depart it, for example, by having a look on, on, the, on the output. Do you want to uh, do a regression or do you want to do a classification? In, in terms of regression, the basic idea is that the output is a continuous variable or maybe a, uh, many different continuous variables. And the very basic idea of um, AI, of machine learning, is you start with data. So here we see sample data. Those blue dots on the x-axis and y-axis, we have something like that looks like a straight line. So this is by sample data. And we have a gap at x equals 5. So what can you do? You can take a model that potentially could solve your, your problem in, in modeling this sample data. And in this case, I will choose a linear equation with two parameters, theta 1, theta 2. And what I do now is I start with arbitrary numbers of 4, theta 1, theta 2, and plot this line. And now I'm doing applied optimization series. So I compute the error between my, my first guess and my data points, and then optimize theta 1, theta 2 with respect to getting better results, which means lower error between my estimation and my real data. And so we end up in something that like, looks like this. So now we have a model with fixed theta 1, theta 2. And for example, now I can predict, hey, at my gap x equals 5, I think the output is 10. So that's how basically machine learning works when you have data and you work with this data. So now let's have a look on those examples for uh, cobots and quality inspection and how this relates to regression problems. So here we see um, a lady teaching a robot how to 
weight powder. And this is a part of the so-called imitation learning process. So the robot learns from what human beings teach the robot. And the basic idea or the benefit of AI-based robot control is the ability of the robot to react on variances in the process or in the environment. So it's not static programmed. If this happens, then do that. But we learn sequences, and those learned in sequences have the ability to, to generalize. So they can react on something that may be uh, a little bit unforeseen. How can you do that? So in this case, um, our one of our customer, Denso Wave, used a standard uh, PC out of the shelf, so a C6650, put TwinCat 3 on it for uh, for the the logic for, the, for everything that has to be placed in real time, and also because it's an industrial PC, used Python on top of it in the user mode, and also accessed from uh, from the user mode using Python uh, GPUs that has been equipped with the C6650 to run the learning process and also the inference process. Let's shift to another example, the integrated quality inspection. So in this example, we, uh, our customer wanted to uh, monitor the enclosing process of preformed punch sleeve enclosures. So we enclosure the, the uh, around the conical neck um, of the anchor bolt. And so this needs to be monitored. So until this project, the enclosure of the quality was basically um, monitored by, by manual inspection, uh, inspection. so uh, with, with a goat. And of course, if you want to reach 100% of quality inspections, this is n not a, 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 the final idea. And one of the requirements was we want to use only the data available that is already existing in our machines. So the idea was monitor basically all the um, the actuator's uh, feedback signals that you have that interact with the process and then model um, an algorithm that is able to predict um, in, in sort of, of a regression problem um, the geometric key data for this enclosing sleeve. So sleeve width or height and the opening. And in doing so, uh, our customer had been able to um, to monitor trends, so it, so those trends or those defects don't appear out of a sudden, but it's 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 a trend. And if you do a regression problem, you have the, uh, if you solve a regression problem and monitor or predict the sleeve width over longer periods, you can see this trend, how it is proceeding, and of course, on top of this um, regression trends, you can also do classification. But classification is something that Rahul will explain in the next few slides. Yeah. So, so classification. Classification is easier to understand, I would say, as compared to regression. What are some of the examples of classification? I mean, the simplest thing you can understand uh, w when you go for strawberry plucking uh, in a farm. Yeah. So you would definitely realize that a particular strawberry, which is pure red, it's it's ripen now yeah and other strawberries which are a little bit green and white you will not of course touch them because you know that and that's basically classification so you are already able to with your human intelligence classify between a good one versus not so good one yeah so same goes here in the classification concept here um, here today we are going to speak a little bit about this classification theory but apart from classification theory th here there are two major applications in this webinar we are going to cover one is predictive quality a specific component is good or bad and from predictive energy point of view if the energy consumption is good or bad now how do you define energy consumption good or bad most of you probably would be familiar of this KPI usually used in electricity industry in your production facilities, KWH per kilogram in metal industry, or let's say KWH per component if it is an automotive industry. Yeah, kilowatt hour uh, per, per kilogram, let's say. If that is the KPI of your energy production, you would definitely have set a specific threshold that if your KWH per kilogram goes beyond this, 
this is not at all acceptable and we will call that particular region bad energy and the lower one is good behavior let us understand this in detail okay perfect so in 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 case of predictive quality here as you can see production facility production line um and in, in this production line you can see that in the beginning you have your input material data it goes into the the, the manufacturing process in this in in case of die casting your input material data is your molten aluminum it goes into a die casting uh, uh, machine and then what comes out is a casted wheel a casted automotive product component and th if this automotive component is good or bad usually in die casting industry people use x ray machines in order to detect if a specific part is good or bad yeah this is simple concept now if what we do is we take the historical data in the historical data we see which ones were good wheels and which ones were the bad ones and corresponding to the bad ones we will uh, train our ai algorithm you can also say that corresponding to those bad ones the patterns the pattern recognition we will do those pattern recognition and those patterns will keep stored in this ai model and in future this ai will keep learning on its own again and again and it would keep storing all different kind of patterns so this is the concept um here i i i am also giving a very brief um, impact analysis from our past experiences in this industry we can definitely say that oe increment up to 5% reducing your rejections starting from 20 30% within first year it can go all the way up to 60% reduced rejections it can also help us saving the energy and finally monetary benefits who does not like monetary benefits perfect so now let us understand the predictive energy use case as well um in case of predictive energy as i have explained earlier two very important kpis one is kwh per kilogram and the second one is kwh per automotive component which is being manufactured in your manufacturing facility um tracking these two kpis is extremely important in industry setup how do we do that by the way how do we optimize these two kpis i am presenting these three very concrete use cases from our experiences working with more than 50 factories predictive power factor variation very important a predictive use case power factor is not only important for internal operation department but also for external agencies the government regulations are so strict in some of the countries power factor has to be kept as high as possible anomaly detection in case of appliance startup again very important use case specifically for maintenance experts in this webinar whoever are maintenance experts they would definitely realize the importance of appliance startup handling what we have seen in many factories the appliance startup always shows an energy anomalies and sometimes these ano energy anomalies are too big that they contribute they actually make your kpis fluctuate a lot kwh per kilogram and kwh per component they go out of the bound how do we save that this is also something very important utilizing ai we can do that the final ai concrete use case for energy is ai based duty cycle optimization and now apart from these use cases as i have mentioned earlier as well it's very important to see how much benefits are we receiving what are the impact in terms of monetary saving the impact is up to 200000 euro per year this is applicable in our experience for a factory of 40 to 50 million euro cost and there they have the energy cost up to let's say 2 to 3 million euro that is the bracket where we have seen this 5 to 10% of energy savings apart from energy savings in terms of monetary benefits there are also impact in terms of carbon neutrality the importance of carbon neutrality topic is very much uh, known to everyone environment definitely very important and one of the key factor nowadays every automotive tier 1 tier 2 supplier are running after these are also some of the biggest requirement from the oems as well and hence this is also very important topic yeah so um, in this webinar now i think we understood these four use cases these four use cases are essentially just tip of iceberg we have much more uh, um, let's say number of use cases available in twarit industrial ai platform we will definitely talk more about it in the second phase of this webinar thank you rahul for this nice introduction of of your 
predictive energy and quality topics. Now let's switch the topic a little bit to understanding how a um, AI initiative or AI project really works. So what are the steps and what are the milestones to achieve? Rahul, can you explain to us a little bit the, the, these milestones here given on the slide? Definitely. Why is it important? I think we have to definitely understand this. Um, I mean, it's, it's so important. This is, at the end of the day, an AI recipe. And I think every one of us are aware a recipe in, in your kitchen. If there is something wrong in the recipe, it requires certain ingredient, salt, chili, pepper. In Indian kitchen, the number of ingredients are probably more than 30, more than 50. The concept applies, the same concept applies here. If your ingredients of the AI are not good, your AI will not function. Let us understand what are those ingredients. Okay, so, so this first very important thing is to be aware about the data. Data awareness is very, very important ingredient. The second one is being hardware ready. If we are not hardware ready, we cannot collect the data. Without data, sorry, no analytics, no AI, no benefits. Data readiness, data driven. Data driven is also very, very important philosophy. Once we have data, let us start utilizing them for calculation of the important KPIs. As I talked earlier, these important KPIs can be from energy perspective, from defect perspective, and also from MTTR, MTBF perspective for predictive maintenance use cases. Once we have these four steps, then only we will become AI ready. And finally, we will be able to utilize Twarit industrial AI software. And this software definitely can give you the benefits. Let's go back, take a reverse journey. What are these four steps? Fabian, please. Yeah, so what are the uh, functions or the products where Backoff can help you in, in those milestones? Hardware ready. So that's simple. Uh, PC-based control is a key concept in being hardware ready for AI pro uh, processes because the PC-based control offers you the, uh, the opportunity to combine your um, automation technology or operation technology with the um, information technology. So it's all the same device. We provide you the interfaces to uh, bring all your data from the shop floor to the upper hier hierarchy layers. That's the basic concept of PC-based control, being using the synergies between information technology and au um, automation or operation technology. Data ready. So we also, of course, offer you the, the tooling, the, the flexible uh, products to somehow get the data out of your controllers. So for example, the database server already years in the field and uh, still being used in many, many applications that connects you directly from the PLC to a um, database of your choice, for example, Progress or uh, MySQL or MS SQL, doesn't matter. You choose your database and we offer the interface using the database server. And then you stream directly from the PLC into an SQL or even a no SQL database. Analytics Logger, a quite new product, um, is also able to to basically realize something like a flight recorder of, of your PLC. So it's meant to be right now the most performant data logger that we have. So you, you instantiate your analytics logger, you select by just clicking in the engineering system what vari variables do you want to have logged. You select the target where it uh, has to be logged and that's it. Or the oldest software product in the field here, the TwinCat Scope. TwinCat Scope we already had this in, in TwinCat 2. It's now uh, the TwinCat 3 scope, and it's equipped with lots of different possibilities to record data, to, uh, to store data in different file formats. Data driven. So, of course, we also provide you with the tools for first exploring your data. Like we have the condition monitoring toolbox for doing in the PLC feature engineering, if you like, we provide you tools like TwinCat Analytics to um, basically engineer your signal analysis change 
that trains not in the PLC language, but in the graphical interface. And of course, we have the inbuilt machine learning inference engine that also allows you to directly compute your uh, machine learning algorithms, maybe also some, some pre-processing um, some, some pre, um, steps like a PCA directly in the PLC. And then we end up at the very um, end at step five with AI ready and turret industrial AI. So, kitchen is ready. We have all the ingredients. We have bought everything what is needed in order to make a very tasty recipe. Yeah. Now, what is the second step? The second step is to choose what exactly do we have to make. In, in other terms, if I say, what kind of use case shall we start, which is going to be the most testy use case, I would say. It's very important to select this particular use case also for the senior management, because at the end of the day, they want to see, they want to feel it, they want to test it. How good is it in order to expand? What here I am showing is a use case selection framework. For a typical die casting industry, this, this, this is one of the example, but eventually this can also be applicable for your industry. Here on the top, I have written melting, which is process step number one. Casting is process step number two. Then heat treatment, machining, and finally an automotive component gets painted. Once it is painted, the recipe is ready. It can be distributed. Now, on th this side, I have explained the kind of use cases, prescriptive quality, maintenance, energy initiative, and then finally production planning initiatives. These are more or less the four biggest areas where industrial AI can help very much. Here, how do we select these use cases? From Twarit side, we provide services in order to do the estimation of ROI. We have these ROI frameworks ready. And on the basis of that, we take decisions. For instance, in melting area, energy is the most important KPI. And hence, you can see here is the red dot. And similarly, those other use cases are also identified. They are prioritized. And then they are ranked. The number one use case or number two, number three is selected in collaboration with customer users. And once this is selected, let us understand now step number three. Perfect. So step number three. Step number three is user onboarding. Why is this user onboarding important? I think uh, there is a little bit also a myth in the uh, market that, that, that uh, AI can work all alone, completely in an automated manner. Um, I, I think probably some of the consumer AI does that. But unfortunately, here in this case of industrial AI, it's not the case. In case of industrial AI, it's very important to onboard the user. Also, it's very important for users to understand. It's also very important to train them so that at each step of our industrial AI implementation journey, we are together. For this, we have framework for assessment, preparing a plan, preparing industrial AI journey, finally the planning of it, implementation, and once industrial AI has implemented, finally, how do you sustain? How do you sustain those results? And once you do all these steps, and once the users do all these steps, then only success is assured. And then only this recipe will taste wonderful. Yeah. So, so this is the overall concept. And we make sure that users are very well trained for all of these steps. And they take huge interest in implementing this journey. Perfect. OK, so for the step number five, sorry, for the step number four, I would say once we have the AI readiness, which is your getting, getting your kitchen ready. Number two was selecting a specific recipe, a use case. Number three, getting users ready, onboarding them. Now let us start with data science project. This, is, this comes in step number four. So please, without doing those three steps, please do not start directly with the data science. Data science is a technology. Industrial AI implementation is a technology. But those three steps are very important from organizational point of view. Perfect. So let us understand this data science life cycle. This is a pretty known DM CRISP methodology. In this methodology, step number one of a data science project start always from data collection. 
business understanding and data understanding. This is more like a loop. Here, Fabian also will bring his expertise to explain how can we implement those three steps. Further, once we have the data, the fourth step is data preparation, AI modeling, Evaluation is also very important. How good is this recipe? We have to test this. Otherwise, we can't really implement. We can't really deploy. And then finally comes the deployment. Let us understand from Fabian the initial three steps. Well, so of course, first of all, the, the business understanding has to be the, the key driver of the complete project. And that's why we also have the domain expert at the very right here um, together with the TwinCat specialist and also with the data scientist. So only all those players together, maybe also the data engineer, if this is a uh, distinctive role, um, they all work together in this project. So the domain expert uh, provides the business understanding. They know what they want to achieve. The TwinCat expert can help with the data collection. So the, the TwinCat expert knows how to get the data, how to bring in meta information, how to uh, store the data and also how the data needs to be understood, uh, how to understand this data. So, um, and it's, it's a deep interaction always with the domain expert. The domain expert knows the process. The TwinCat expert has the know-how of, of the real implementation, maybe on the PLC. And together they can work on, on the data understanding. And of course, this A is, is a loop. So without understanding the, uh, the data and, with and, and, and in contrast to the business understanding, um, this doesn't work. Only if you have a fruitful data that relates to your business concept, then it makes sense to hand over to the data scientist who will then continue with the modeling. And Rahul will explain then the next few steps. Great, perfect. So here the data preparation is very important in order to make the data in a correct format. The format, if the format is not important, uh, unfortunately, the machine learning, deep learning, neural network related algorithms, they will not understand what is this data. Yeah, so you have to uh, form your input parameter space as well as your output parameter space in a certain format. Then, of course, these neural network deep learning algorithms will work. And finally comes the evaluation. We will also talk about these things in detail now in the coming slides. And of course, the final step is then to deploy your learned algorithm somewhere in the factory floor. And of course, the deployment uh, step is, is very crucial. So, um, and there are many different requirements, maybe to in terms of, of deterministic behavior, latency, or compute power. And we will see in the, in the next uh, few minutes what what kind of, of products and, and um, support we can um, add to, to your AI project as back off. So maybe let's start with data collection. Let's have a, a quick look into what is yeah relevant. So most mostly it's yeah basically you start with I want to have data, but then you need to ask questions like what kind of data, what is the infrastructure, also from IT perspective, and what are, uh, or what, and also what is the data? Data is only a value like 24 or 57. If, if you bring this data to a data scientist, hey, I have collected lots of data, so a table of uh, 1 million variables, and there is something like, hey, th here is, is 42 and here is 70, uh, 75. This will not help. The data scientist will always need to have meta information. So the basically the data has the requirements to be to hold meta information, maybe the unit and also other meta information maybe on, on the um, on the production step or whatever is relevant to understand this this value. It has the data has to be structured and of course it has to be computer readable. So don't work with with data formats that nobody understands because otherwise the data scientists will go mad and work hours on just getting the data into his framework. And Beckhoff provides you lots of different um, products to, to realize this data logging. So we already um, introduced a few of them like TwinCat Scope, Analytics Logger um, and Database Server. 
And on top here, we also have the, the data agent or uh, Twinket IoT products that realize a communication interface to the I IoT hierarchy layers. So what is the difference between all those products? Differences are, for example, you can choose a data format. We, we all, so for example, we have uh, Twinket scope, which can log in, for example, CSV files or in, in TDMS files. We have the analytics logger, which is able to first of all log in a binary format, but then offers you the possibility to convert again to computer readable and standard fo um, file formats. We have the database server with a standard connectivity to standard SQL and NoSQL databases. We have the Twinket IoT products here with the data agent, which um, enables you to, to communicate standard JSON packages over MQTT to a message broker, which can then forward the message to, uh, to your database of, of choice. What is also the difference, not only the data format, but also the communication way. Um, for example, if you use the data agent, you can speak MQTT or AMQP. It's, it, it really matters on, on the IT infrastructure of, of the end customer. Um, what kind of ports are open, for example? Do you have the allowance to, to use MQTT or AMQTT ports? Uh, or are you only uh, allowed to use OPC UA? Um, that is one aspect in communication. On the other hand, are you, um, are you allowed to store your data locally somewhere on, on a disk, for example? Or is there an SQL server available in the network? Or is there a, a private or even a public cloud available in the network? And depending on all those different requirements that may um, yeah, occur in, in a uh, product, production environment, we can always choose the right product out of the shelf and use standard products for all those use cases. Perfect. So we have data. What do we do next? OK, so as I explained earlier, we need to bring this data in a correct format. Traceability is very important in order to make the format of the data very correct. Traceability is a very important concept in the industrial AI implementation. Traceability, in simpler terms, is essentially to trace a specific automotive component object under a manufacturing process. How do we trace it? And then corresponding to that particular component, how do we format the input pr process parameter space, input data? In this uh, example, we are showing the raw material as the starting point, warehouse. From warehouse, the material goes in the manufacturing process. Finally, after manufacturing process, the finalized product gets out quality is happening, and then finally finished product is distributed. And in this process, traceability is important. From back off side, we have some uh, uh, traceability products. Let us hear. Well, of course, uh, it, it always depends on the, on the real application, uh, on the requirements, what kind of, of product can be chosen. But for example, if it comes to, to the warehouse, um, for example, uh, the, the, yeah, basically the concept of, of our open au automation infrastructure is, is very important. For example, if you um, have the ability to use a QR code reader which implements an OPC interface, then of course you can directly speak with your PLC. So I've, cho I've chosen this, this product out of the shelf and now I'm placing this in the production line. If you use, for example, our um, extended transport system or the explainer system to transport your product through the production line, you always have maximum of traceability because you don't, uh, don't leave your, your product alone on a conveyor, but, but you hold it all the time and you know wh exactly where it is. So you have full flexibility and full traceability during the complete process through the machine. And of course, in the end, quality assessment we have lots of different products. One example might be for uh, Twincat Vision for vision-based quality inspection at the end of the line. Perfect. OK, what next? So here we have data. We have data in correct format. What next? 
once the data is in correct format, we start putting this data into our AI algorithms. Our AI algorithms essentially takes in a very simple uh, uh, manner these data as input and they train the neural networks if it is a deep learning algorithm or if it is a machine learning, then those algorithms. This is pretty clear concept nowadays for everyone. Very easy to understand. You have the input process parameter space and you have your output and we, we can simply train AI algorithm. Now, apart from this, apart from the data driven methodology, there is still one last piece of the puzzle which is missing. What is that? I think uh, uh, probably most of you can guess already for an industrial AI project, domain expertise is very, very important. And precisely that's what I am talking here about. The last fourth piece in this case is physics and chemistry based knowledge. How do we embed the physics process or chemistry based process knowledge into our AI? That's where Twarith has invented a new algorithm, which is hybrid AI, hybrid industrial AI. And this hybrid model approach not only takes the input data from material process quality, but also it takes the data input data from finite element modeling. And finite element analysis essentially gives us the defect uh, uh, simulations, the simulated data. And once you combine the simulated data with your real time process data, results are going to be amazing. Perfect. And this is just a very brief glimpse about um, our software, the, the Twarith Industrial AI Framework. How does it look like? Um, in our Twarith Industrial AI Framework, we have first these three steps machines, parameter, and jobs. Uh, machines, there we can define a specific type of machine. We already have a repository of machine for uh, uh, metal industry, but eventually for others as well, we can create this repository. Next step is for that particular machine, what are the important parameters? Temperature, pressure, torque, airflow, etc. All of them can be set in the phase number two. Then comes the jobs. Here in the jobs, you can actually choose specific type of data science step which you want to run on the data and the results are also shown in a very easy to understand manner here you can click on the button output output will show you the the end result of the algorithm okay good so now uh, we have talked really about um, how to run this industrial ai software uh, once we have uh, um, the results available with us. The next logical step is to do testing, to do evaluation. I, in case of classification, usually the evaluation matrix, as I have shown in one of the example, is done on the basis of false positive, false negative, true positive, true negative. The most important here is to optimize the number of total false positive and total number of false negatives. Um, once we are able to optimize in, in, in some of the industrial AI application, people want a, a more less number of false negatives. Whereas on other hand, in some other industrial applications, they are afraid of false alarms, false positives. So it, it really depends on the end application. Okay. And finally, these results can be, sh can be shown on a very easy to understand dashboards, users, machine operator, shift supervisors, the foundry managers or the machining area managers, the managers, they can actually see these results and then they can eventually optimize these false positive, false negative. They can give their wishes to our team. Our team eventually can change the backend. And at the end of the day, once everything is super accurate and fantastic, then come th then finally the model can be deployed. Let us understand how deployment work for this nice introduction to your software framework. So of course, in the end, you want to have your algorithm deployed somewhere in the factory floor. So because we use PC based control, we always have processing power. So we can scale the CPU from, for example, the, the small Intel Atom and up to the Intel Xeon processor. It doesn't matter if you use it if, if you use the, the Intel Atom as a controller with PLC logic and, for example, use our Xeon-based server 
as an edge device or you directly use the intelligent based uh, server as a controller. Um, both is possible and this is part of, of the flexibility of what Backoff offers. We provide you the processing power to run the uh, AI models directly um, where the process happens, where the data is generated, which is very close to the PLC. For this, we have also two different, different products available. So one is deploy your learned algorithm directly inside of the PLC, inside of the controller, and run it in hard real time. The other product is deploy it at edge in, in the user mode with the ability to also access hardware accelerators. Then we provide you a PLC interface and you can, as a PLC programmer, still use uh, standard PLC logic, PLC function blocks inside of our Twinkit machine learning library that you can instantiate and work with. And so we have a high performance interface then between Twinkit and the inference engine, either the inference engine directly runs inside of Twinket in hard real time or um, near the process and with maybe access to GPUs or other hardware accelerators like um, FPGAs in the user mode. The third possibility, of course, is to use cloud deployment. Um, if you don't need to have a, a reaction back to the machine, of course, Cloud deployment is uh, a good opportunity to run your AI also. So you just communicate from the factory floor to the cloud, run your AI algorithm, and for example, show the result on a dashboard. If you don't need to have um, a reaction back, that's in most cases totally fine. And now I want to welcome back Tobias. Uh, so Tobias, we spoke now a lot about uh, industrial AI, what is it? We talked about different classes of application. We sh have shown how a, an AI project works. And now I want to uh, invite you to provide us a little bit more in-depth information with, with your experience with, for example, the, the application of low pressure die casting. Thank you, Fabian. Thank you. Um, as you've mentioned it, uh, we will pick one particular example of the manufacturing process of these beautiful guys here, namely aluminum wheels. And the reason why we want to demonstrate this is uh, because we've talked about optimizing production processes. On the other hand, we talked about AI. And there's a gap between how can we leverage AI and information which can be provided by it to optimize production processes. And for this asset, let's take the example of the given manufacturing process of low pressure die casting of aluminum wheels. And when we look at that process, we can see that there are basically three steps if we categorize them broadly. The first one is the melting and uh, the degassing process in which basically aluminum ingots and a small amount of scrap is used melted at approximately 750 degrees, and then a degassing process happens. This molten metal is then taken forward to the low pressure machine and then uh, poured into the holding furnace. Here, the pressure casting, low pressure casting process takes place, which also happens in three broad steps. Basically, the pressurization in which a certain amount of pressure is applied to the metal which pushes it through a riser tube into the cavity or the mold. Then the uh, mold filling phase happens and then afterwards the solidification in which the poured metal in the mold solidifies and finally the component, the casted aluminum wheel is ejected and this is then checked further down in uh, subsequent quality checks already mentioned was an x-ray testing, further a visual inspection and further down along the value chain is after the machining then an helium air leakage inspection. The challenges our client here in this case was facing is that he had so-called air inclusions and bubbles or so-called microporosities. And when we think of that, um, considering the fact that our client is providing casted aluminum wheels to the overall equipment manufacturers such as Mercedes or BMW, 
And these four wheels that these are actually carrying the whole weight of the car, considering these facts, this quality deviation, especially the porosities, is a big quality problem. Which is why the customer was asking us a few questions or asking themselves, first of all, when do these issues occur? Why do they occur? And what needs to be done in order to avoid these rejections? And to answer this question, we took data from various sources. First of all, we had conversations with the process experts to get some understanding from their side. Which process parameters are important? What have they found out in the past? And how can we use this to pay specific focus to the potential root causes of these quality deviations? Second of all, what we took was um, data from the machines, such as the um, temperatures, the um, flow rates, the air cooling flow rates as set points. So which adjustments or which settings are actually set in the low pressure casting machines. Further, what we used was the actual sensor measured values. So all these parameters that I just described are also measured in the actual values and these were incorporated as well. And finally, we took this data, so data such as process understanding, input material data, and the machine data, and compared this with the quality results that were then taken out in the, uh, the X-ray testing as well as the visual inspection. All of this data was then analyzed by our TIA software, which finds out how these individual parameters play together and affect the quality, and therefore also which of these combinations lead to these quality problems such as microporosities and air inclusions. The software then helps our client to understand and detect deviations early on already in the casting and production process, gives root causes that help him to understand what is actually the root cause, where does this problem come from and which parameters are important ones, and thirdly, gives concrete recommendations on how to adjust casting parameters. Sounds good, but how does this look like in practice? When we enter the software here, the first screen is the quality prediction screen, which gives an overview, first of all, on the current status of the production process. We see here that the current wheel, which is being casted, is approximately at 70% in the cycle time of five minutes. And based on the data which is captured in real time from the AI software, the current evaluation is here, Everything is good, no action needs to be taken, all is on track. Directly underneath, a overview is given over the performance of the past wheels. In this case, um, it was decided to show it for 60 minutes. That shows which of the components being casted in the last 60 minutes were good and were there some rejections. And when we look at this here, we see that most of these wheels were good, had good quality but also a few have been rejected. Now, the question that might arise is, why were there some rejections? And if we now enter the next screen, which is the root cause analysis and suggestion screen, these questions can be answered by given the most influential parameters on the casting process. So for example, we see based out of these five top um, influencing parameters, the solidification rate has a very, very high influence. That basically is the pressure in the third casting process, which tends to have a very important um, aspect towards the quality of the casting. Further, left to that, after we know, okay, these are the actual most important parameters for my casting process, further on the left hand is so-called SHAP values. That is, shows basically the same information at a more granular level. So what is represented here is the specific parameter values in terms of their aspect and effect on the quality. So we see that blue dots here are indicated by a, are indicating a low casting parameter value, whereas red values are indicating a higher value on the range of parameters. And when we look cl closer, for example, at the solidification rate, we see that the um, positive or high parameter values in the range tend to have a slightly positive effect on the casting quality, whereas lower casting values tend to have a negative or even a very, very strong negative aspect. So this root cause analysis helps our client 
to understand a bit more what is actually happening in my casting process and which are the most influential parameters. Coming back to the main screen and to the case that is actually the most important one. Namely, let's assume the software detects a quality rejection. In this case, the software gives a notification via the screen or the defined channel such as email, SMS, Microsoft Teams that says, hey, based on the data, there is a problem occurring on this low pressure casting machine. We now know, okay, something is not right. We know, okay, these are the influential parameters, these are the root causes. But still the remaining question is, what needs to be done to avoid these rejections? And for this, TIA gives precise recommendations on how to adjust the casting parameters, which look like the following. Here we see, namely, the listed parameters which can be adjusted in the casting process. And taking the example of the solidification pressure again, we see that this is currently located at approximately 850 uh, millibar, but should be slightly adjusted to 870. And by giving these concrete recommendations step after step, our client can use these information to optimize his casting process and therefore reduce rejections in the end. Tobias, thank you very much for this deep insights into low pressure die casting. So we have seen that Tvarit is, is working lots in the, the design and the implementation of um, AI software in, and all this ended up in products like the uh, Tvarit Industrial AI Software Package. In the end, of course, you all uh, will ask me the, say, the question again, how can we deploy this in the factory floor? And I want to introduce to you a little bit more in depth the file format Onyx. Onyx is Open Neural Network Exchange. That's the abbreviation. Um, it's a standardized file format for representing trained algorithms, AI algorithms. For example, a deep neural network or a support vector machine or even more complex things. So it just, it's just an instruction list of operators and how they are interconnected. And it's standardized. That's the very, yeah, very, very nice thing. It's a standardized um, file format and most of the AI frameworks can read or write Onyx files. For example, PyTorch or TensorFlow or Scikit-Learn and whatever, MATLAB. And of course, you can also export your trained models from the Tvarit industrial AI software as an Onyx file and then deploy it somewhere. And then you can integrate this Onyx file again in our infrastructure. So as being told before, we provide you the possibility to scale your compute power. You can scale directly the controller power or you can scale an edge device. Um, and we provide you the, the tools, the software tools to um, directly read in this Onyx files and deploy it in a back of in based or Twincat based inference, en inference engine, uh, which is basically directly running in hard real time or at near real time. Um, it always depends on which latency uh, aspects you have to fulfill. So if you have um, requirements regarding hard deterministic real time and lower latency, of course, we always recommend to deploy the model directly in the Twincat environment. Or if you have um, maybe higher uh, needs for in regards of, of compute resources if you need to have access to hardware accelerators you can also um, make use of another back of product that brings you an interface in the PLC but makes use out of the hardware accelerators out of the real-time environment and still is based on the Onyx file format so we always require the Onyx file and we provide you then the inference tools for integrating these Onyx files somewhere in your automation framework. Okay, so given a successful deployment in the uh, factory floor, Tobias, can you please give us um, more insights about the benefits that you can 
gain with low pressure die casting tools from Torrid? Yes, of course. Thank you. That's I think also one of the most important questions when we talk about optimizing production processes with AI. What is actually what is being optimized? What are the benefits? So firstly, one of all is an increased OAE based on our experience up to five percent. Reduced rejections of up to sixty percent within the first year. This, of course, leads also to significant energy savings as less rework and less energy on, for example, melting and casting is required. In this case, accumulates up to 240 giga gigajoules per line yearly. And all of that accumulates in, mon uh, in monetary benefits yearly of 50,000 euros per line. Considering an average plant of 30 to 40 low pressure machines, this then accumulates to 1.5 to 2 million euros per plant yearly. So what have we talked about today? First of all, we talked about what is industrial AI in general? What are the principles behind it? How does it in general work? After that, we delve a bit deeper into the technical implementation. What kind of hardware devices from Beckhoff can be used and what kind of algorithmic modules are used by Twarit to implement such projects. And finally, we wrapped up all of that in a practical example on how to use AI with the low pressure die casting process to reduce scrap. So thank you very much for this nice summary. And of course also thank you for joining us in this webinar. Uh, I want to encourage you to still carry on placing questions in the question dialogue. We are more than happy to answer all of them. And of course, if after the webinar you, uh, you feel a question popping up, don't hesitate to still contact us. We, of course, are uh, yeah, very interested in getting in touch with you, discuss your AI initiatives and help you with the implementation of your AI in the factory floor. So, uh, let's see then some, some questions. Uh, I already heard that we have a couple of questions. And, um, oh yeah, indeed. So, we have a couple of questions, that's good. So, um, One question maybe that is, is uh, maybe for Rahul or for Tobias. Please share something about AI used in laser cutting machines. Yeah, so laser cutting machine, at the end of the day, this is also one of the non-conventional manufacturing process. We are doing one project um, on predictive quality of laser cutting machine, laser beam machining to be very specific. Um, Tobias already explained one of the use case of die casting. There, you already understood that for these kind of AI projects, we need multiple data sources. One is input material data, then we need the process settings, process parameter data, and then we also need the quality data. In case of laser beam machining or um, other cutting processes, let's say the input material can be aluminum composite or some other uh, material. In, in process parameter settings would mainly be your uh, speed of laser cutting as well as the power of laser beam. That's also very, very important for quality. That's what we are doing already in one of the project. And then finally, in order to measure the quality parameter of laser cutted part, basically laser machined part, that depends on your dimension of the, 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 the workpiece as well as the MRR, material removal rate. Now, uh, material removal rate and all these dimensional properties, these quality parameters of this workpiece eventually depends on these process settings. How are they behaving in real time? And that is something we can do even for laser cutting machine. We can essentially from the machine via, let's say, back of PLC or IPC, we can collect these data, not only these three, four critical parameters, but also some other parameters. Because eventually, um, who knows? Uh, if, uh, these uh, three, four important parameters, everyone knows from domain knowledge, these are very important. But sometimes it happens that apart from these parameters, uh, some other process parameters are also playing vital role. So artificial intelligence, this is one of the beauty 
that you can collect all these parameters as well as the input material and then do a correlation with your quality metric, quality output uh, parameter, and eventually build a model. And this model can be a dynamic model. And this dynamic model will be learning day by day, month by month, depending upon this dynamic behavior of laser machines. So I think this is uh, 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 one of the use cases we have done. Apart from this use case, in laser cutting area, uh, predictive maintenance is also very important. So would be very happy to share more about this um, Yeah, if, 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 let's say, any other details are required. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for this detailed answer. Um, well, you, you already started with, y you need data, so you need to collect the data. Uh, we have two questions uh, that I want to, that is, uh, that is yeah, focusing on collecting data. So one is how do you collect data, and the other one is how do you make sure that the data is available in the right format? Do you have any recommendations on how to capture the data from the machines to be able to analyze like predictive quality inspection or predictive energy? Yeah. So um, coincidentally, the part two of this webinar, which is going to happen um, the after tomorrow, we are going to cover this topic very much in detail. Uh, what should be the data format, and how do you arrange all these data sets coming from input material, process parameters, quality, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. How do you even trace it? How do you map this data? Uh, format of this data is going to be discussed. Um, I would definitely recommend, please attend that, webin that, that uh, part two of this webinar. But let me also explain very briefly, um, uh, in terms of data format required, um, for artificial intelligence methodology, there are always two sets. One is input parameter space, we call it X in technical terms, and then one is output parameter space, we call it Y. Now, X can be x1, x2, even x100. And these x1, x2, x3, x100 can be your process parameters, uh, speed, um, torque, pressure, temperature. And also, these uh, x can be also your input material composition. If you are using some aluminum, uh, uh, let's say composite, then what exactly are the impurities in your material? Those can also play as an input, in input parameter for your artificial intelligence. And output is simply the quality let's say, quality of a workpiece. Um, this is essentially the format, and this is pretty simple format at the end of the day. Once we have data in this format, running machine learning, deep learning algorithms is very easy. Yeah, and I may want to add, so if, if, you, if you want to have a recommendation from, from back off side, what, what kind of uh, product you should use for, for data collection, I would always recommend on the one hand, maybe the database server to connect your PLC directly to a SQL or no SQL database. And on the other hand, uh, also the analytics logger, which is, is very high performance. So if you, it's like a flight recorder for, for your machine. You can just uh, store all your data, first of all, in a binary format. And then you can use the scope export tool to convert these binary files into the format of your choice. So that's then, in the end, quite flexible. And but yeah. in, in this webinar, we also have this uh, slide, um, which, which actually yeah. talks about this AI readiness level. And in yeah. this AI readiness level, I think step number one, two, three is exactly data collection. You know, make your machines hardware ready, data collection ready, etc. Mm. So uh, from Fabian, I think there are already some technology names men mentioned. Mm. Um, I think these videos are going to be available. Mm, you can also have a look at it. Okay, great. Then let's have another look. So this is another one for, for my, my friends from Twerit. So uh, how does this software, I think this, the, the question is related to, to, this, to, to your uh, tier software, help to reduce um, scrap in production? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question, which is actually asked quite frequently. And here comes one important thing uh, into perspective and the understanding of the real manufacturing processes. Because on the one hand, we have a technology that has the potential to find out, for example, which parameters are affecting the quality in which way, and also to give recommendations what to adjust. But these recommendations doesn't necessarily mean that the scrap is being reduced. And this bridge is captured or created by the software, by so-called user interfaces that are provided for the specific personas. Taking the example of the low pressure die casting process that we have presented in this webinar as well, um, what we do or what we have done in developing the software is to have really in-depth um, 
conversations with our client and then to have the ability to understand, okay, there's various layers, various um, escalation levels, what, what it's called in this way, um, that are we doing different things and having different responsibilities in the manufacturing process. So for example, we have an operator, we have the foundry supervisor or shift supervisor, and we have the foundry manager. And further, we have process experts. And all of these different roles and personas have different um, responsibilities in the manufacturing process and the way how we ensure that the software itself actually um, helps our clients to reduce scrap is by providing the user interface in a way that it especially maps these various user types and these can then take the these recommendations or this information that's provided in the dashboard or user interfaces by the, uh, for them to make changes in the manufacturing process. Thank you Tobias for this Explanation. Um, I have two more questions. So one is, uh, can I generate the Onyx file from my scikit environment? So that's pretty easy. Yes, is the short answer. <laughs> what kind of models are supported? That's going to be a little bit more. Uh, yeah, it's the, the short answer on that is hundreds of different models are supported in the Onyx format. So the the Onyx is is very generic. So it can um, describe, for example, a support vector machine, a linear regression, a CNN, an LSTM, a K nearest neighbor, whatever. So there are so many different, um, yeah, model types, and as far as yeah, m most of them I wouldn't wouldn't say 100%. I'm not completely sure, but most of them are cov covered by the by the Onyx description because Onyx always only describes the operators <coughs> of. What what so if I have some inputs, what kind of operators do I need to, um, yeah, apply to those inputs and then pass it to to the next layer? So that's how Onyx works. And um, of course, then the other question is: so what kind of um, yeah uh, models are supported inside of our uh, inference engines? And that's maybe also related to the second question I have here. So is the inference engine on GPU a new product or a new function? Can we already test it? Um, yeah, so indeed, the, this inference engine that, uh, that is also able to, to use the GPU power is a new product that we uh, will present on, on the SPS Fair in November, um, so 2021. And um, basically, we have then two inference engines. One inference engine hard real-time execution inside our PLC. And there we have a limited um, function set of models that we currently support. So because we need to make optimize them for real-time execution, currently we support um, MLPs and support vector machines. Currently hardly working on a release to support also PCA and um, random forest and k-means. And for, for the next year, for 2022, we want to also run LSTMs and CNNs in, in this real-time engine. This other um, inference engine that is also able to, to use the GPU power, this is more generic. So it's, um, it's a generic uh, ONNX runtime component, so it can host whatever type of model and um, can use the, the GPU or the integrated GPU of, of your Intel processor. Um, but in the end, doesn't doesn't uh, run in hard real time, but it's a separate process and it's interfaced to the PLC. But this is something that we also um, investigate a, li a little bit more in depth in the second part of the webinar on on Thursday this, this week. So I r really want to encourage you to also have a look on the second webinar uh, running on on Thursday. Okay, I don't see any more questions coming in right now, so. Thank you very much um, again. And yeah, hopefully see you on, s on Thursday for the second part of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much from Twarit side as well. Thank you for having uh, uh, hearing from us. I see you again on Thursday.